Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm Nikolai Parlock. I'm a Java developer advocate with Oracle. And today I'm going to talk about Amber, Loom, Panama, and Valhalla. And to those of you who don't exactly know what that is, that's fine. Uh, so the JDK is developed in larger projects. And these larger projects try to tackle larger problems and then come up with solutions that are then over time introduced into the JDK so that we can then you know, all, all benefit from that. Um, so I'm going to go over these four projects. And Project Valhalla specifically is one that Brian Goetz, who works on that, once heard about that it's about four PhD, no, sorry, six PhD theses in one project. So by that, we're doing some quick math. We are ahead of about 24 PhD theses in about 50 minutes. So we have to hurry. I cannot tell you all of this in detail. This is not a tutorial. You're not going to come go home and be like, OK, I can use all of these in practice, A, because they're not out yet, but also B, because this will be too much of a high-level overview for that. We're going to see some code, but it's not about understanding the code. It's about understanding what these projects are trying to do and where they're going. The slides are already online at slides.nipavx.dev. You can take a look there and uh, follow along if you want to. OK, so let's begin with Project Amber. Um, Project Amber is about smaller, productivity-oriented Java language features. And if you see the slides, or if you have the slides in front of you, the, all of these are links to the project, the wiki, the mailing list. So you can get in touch and follow along a little bit closer. It was launched in March 2017 and is led by Brian Getz. And the motivation here is to tackle some specific downsides of Java. So Java can be perceived as cumbersome, and it tends to require a specific boilerplate in some situations where you just cannot clearly express what you're trying to say. Um, and Amber is not so much a solution as it is in good uh, Java uh, tradition. It's a solution factory, or you should probably see it as a solution factory. It will not end at some point. It will continuously find these places where, Amber, uh, sorry, where Java has shortcomings and tackle them. It already has done this in the past, too. So opposed to all other of these projects, it already has stuff out there that are in production, ready to be used right now. So it started with var in Java 10, local variable type inference, and went to switch expressions, text blocks, type pattern matching, record, and seal types. And these are not entirely independent of one another. Actually, uh, the f like four of them, seal types, records, type pattern matching, and switch, exp switch expressions, are connected to one another. And they all fall under the umbrella of pattern matching. And I just noticed that I didn't take a slide out. So if you can go back in time to DevOx UK, you can watch a talk about pattern matching there. <laughs> um, but that talk's actually online. So if you're interested in pattern matching, you can watch that talk. Or you can just look for pattern matching on YouTube. There are a couple of presentations, including one of mine. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to present to you something entirely different that Project Amber is working on, and that is string composition. OK, so let's settle in here. Let's see how would you compose strings in Java. So we have the situation here where apparently I want to create a query uh, that has like a select statement, but the property and value, I want to plug those in. And those are two good ways to do that. Or well, whether they're good ways, we're going to discuss that. But those are two ways to do that. You can either use the plus, or you can use string formatting. There are even more ways to do it. It's a bit cumbersome, and it comes with a free SQL injection. So that's not great. Um, other languages have it much easier. They can just do something. Oh, no. There's a considerable delay here. OK, there we go. Well, you already saw the joke. But anyway, so there are other languages where you can do something like this, uh, where you have some way to tell the language that this string is one where you will embed other um, expressions in. And I just made up this syntax. You'll see later why. But the idea here is that I can have a backslash curly brace, and that starts an expression, or in this case, just a reference to a variable name. So this makes it much easier. Now, here should be the joke. Something is like, maybe it's running out of battery or something. I'm just going to stand here, which is probably also helpful for the camera people, and use the cursors instead. Um, yes, so this comes with the free SQL uh, injection that you can now achieve much faster, um, which probably not ideal. But SQL injections are not the only concern here. Um, you, you generally want to not have just simple strings. In most cases, you want to have very specific strings. You want to create something that's HTML or XML, JSON, YAML, TOML, whatever. All of these have format-specific rules that should be validated, ideally. And this is where string templates come in. There's a jet draft for that. That would be the link there. And um, you can use this. In this case, I'm not using it with a single inline string. I'm using it with a text block. 
just to make it more readable, but both of those variants work. And we have two aspects here. One of them is the text block that says the select star from, and it has these uh, property and value references embedded. Like if we would have proper syntax highlighting for this, this would be differently highlighted, right? Um, oh, well, let me see. There you go. So this would, of course, be a different highlight, right? Because this is a reference, it's not a string, it's a reference uh, to something, um, to, to a variable. Now, that's what we call uh, the template, or the templated string with those embedded expressions. But what Java does on top is add a layer of indirection and have a templating policy here as well. So this str dot that you see at the beginning that takes this templated string and turns it into an actual string. For example, we could use the str policy to just uh, concatenate the strings. Very simply, we're just going to have here, we have variables desk and price and uh, qty, which is quantity. Um, and all of those we just embed here to create something like a, like a receipt, right? So that would just be regular string concatenation. That's fine. But if you look closely, you will see that there are some uncommon things. For example, the text is given with three, also the total is given with uh, three decimal places, which is uncommon. Uh, so what we want to do on top of that is probably format this. And that could be a different policy. So now this policy, which is not str anymore, but fmtr. Now fmtr could apply all of these well-known formatter strings that you can use um, to format the strings, the, or the variables that you want to put out. And now the text is actually 355 and not whatever it was before. Let's take a back and talk about why strings even. So as I mentioned earlier, we often want to have something like XML, like JSON, like you know, some smart format. So what we've done so far is we start with a string and put in some values. We turn all of that into the most basic representation, which is another string. And then we take that string, likely, in all likelihood, and give it to something else that then has to parse it into a JSON object, into a statement or whatever. Why take the detour? Why do we first go from string and values to a string and then go back up to a higher level of abstraction? And that's where the templating policy shows its real strength. So this is the interface that needs to be implemented for a templating policy. The important detail here is that the function apply or the method apply takes as input the templated string, but the output is not necessarily a string. It's of type result, which can be any type. So the policy doesn't actually have to create a string. For example, a library or even the SQL module uh, or just you know, your code could just provide this policy. This policy, again, takes the select star from, which looks like a query, but instead of parsing it to a string, it, or rather concatenating it to a string, it can immediately parse it to a statement. Same with JSON. And so these policies, they know what they're doing. A, a simple string concatenation like Java, it doesn't know whether it's SQL or JSON or XML it's working on. It can just do stupid things. But this can do smart things. It can validate and verify, it can escape, it can make sure that what you get out is actually a proper, safe, in this case, SQL statement, for example. I think that's pretty cool, um, but it's in very early stages. Right, so what I just showed you is described in a JEP draft. A JEP is the JDK enhancement proposal. So these projects usually generate JEPs at some point. And before that, we have discussions on the mailing lists and ideas flying around, and then somebody sits down and drafts a JEP. And that draft goes through a time of evolution and figuring out whether it's the best way to do this. And at some point, the JEP is finalized. It can still change, but that's, le uh, that's less likely. And then after that, at some point, the code is, uh, the JEP is targeted to a specific Java release. And then the code gets merged. And even then, it's not final, right? We've seen preview features now for a while, which means even after that, things can still change. So from the idea being discussed on the mailing list, to the feature being shipped as a preview. In all of these stages, things can change, but change becomes less likely the further on to the process we are. Right? So a JEP draft is in an early stage that could to look totally different tomorrow. When you have a preview feature, it can look totally different tomorrow, but it's very unlikely. OK, um, but this is not all that Ember is doing. Uh, it's uh, still working on pattern matching, as I mentioned earlier, and it will be in third preview in JDK 19. It wants to add more patterns. And then there's the idea of concise method bodies, for which, again, there's just a draft. 
And then maybe at some point we get um, a better serialization mechanism, but that's even just a white paper. So that's like very far in the future. Okay, if you, um, oh, all right, so Project Amber makes Java more expressive, reduces the amount of code, and makes, hopefully makes us more productive. And if you're anything like me, you're hearing this and wondering, but when is this gonna happen? Because I wanna have this sooner rather than later. Now, if you ask the people who actually work on this and don't just talk about it, they will tell you, you will see these features when they're done, right? And, you know, to be honest, that's the only good answer you can give. But it's also a very boring answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out on a limb and give you my personal guesses. These are based on information from the mailing list and from the JEPs, so this is not inside uh, knowledge. And it's also something that you cannot sue Oracle for if this doesn't happen. So keep that in mind. My personal guess is that next year we'll see patterns being finalized. I hope that we can see the construction patterns and template strings preview. And then in the years after, we're probably going to see more stuff happening with patterns. There are already a bunch of ideas in the pipeline. If you open the slides on your machine later, there are tons of links here that you can follow up uh, on pattern matching, for example. And I invite you to do that. Okay, that was Amber. Deep breath. Now we're going to talk about Project Panama, which is a totally different beast, does something entirely different. It's about interconnecting JVM and native code. Again, here are a bunch of links that you can follow up on, and uh, it was launched in July 2014. It's led by Maurizio Cimadamore at the moment, and it falls apart into three sub-projects, Vector API, Foreign Memory API, and Foreign Function API, and the last two are strongly connected. But let's start with the Vectors and Vector API. Let's say you have code like this. Uh, you have two arrays, A and B, uh, with numbers, and you want to compute an array of numbers C. So you always want to take one out of A and one out of B and do this computation to achieve C. The computation is meaningless in this case. It's square A, square B, add them up, and then take the negative of that. But you want to do that for all the arrow trees in A and B. This is something that your CPU can potentially do much faster than it might look like at first. Uh, because um, modern CPUs have so-called multi-word registers. There can be up to 512 bits, which is the case on this uh, Intel uh, CPU, and it's 256 on my Ryzen at home. And that means this register can store multiple numbers at the same time. For example, 16 floats, up to 16 floats. Well, not up to. You can even have like 1,024 bits, I think, of multi-word registers. And then it can execute several computations at once. So instead of having one register with a float and another register with a float and do one CPU cycle for one addition, it can have one register with 16 floats and another register with 16 floats, and then takes about one CPU cycle, or you know, addition, I think, is one. Don't quote me on the one cycle. But it takes about as much time to add 16 pairs to 16 results as it takes to add one pair to one result. And this is called SIMD, or Single Instruction Multiple Data, because you're having one instruction, which is addition, applied to multiple data points. And this is great. This is, I think, Intel's MMX is mainly that. Uh, what they did like back in the 90s, I think there was. And the just-in-time compiler knows about that. It aims for that. It tries to figure out whether the loop that you're writing can be vectorized. And that's called auto-vectorization. And that works in general, often, but it's not reliable. You cannot depend on that actually being the case. And this is where the vector API comes in. The vector API tries to make it uh, much more easy to write code that reliably results in, in, vector, in this uh, vectorization. And we don't have to go over all the details. Um, I think what the important part is, is what happens uh, in, let me see, in this section of the loop. There you go. Where we pull a bunch of values from the A array in vector A, and then we pull a bunch of stuff from the B array into vector B, and then we say vector A, multiply with A, and then add the multiplication of B and B, and then we take the negative, right? So that vector C is then the result, and then we take that and write it back into the result array. And this stuff will work great on all CPUs. So first of all, this is a very clear and concise API, given the requirements. It doesn't look clear and concise, um, but if you think about all the requirements, then that's really um, pretty much the best you can achieve. It's platform agnostic, meaning it doesn't matter which platform you're targeting, whether it has 512 bits in registers or 256 or none at all even, you will reliably see runtime compilation that uses this feature optimally and uses optimal performance. And if the runtime you're targeting, or rather the, the CPU you're targeting doesn't have that at all, 
the performance will be, doesn't have multi-word registers at all. I mean, you will get basically the same performance uh, as you would have gotten with a loop. And that's a, that's a pretty good result, particularly for image processing, for like, in, like machine learning, in general a situation where you do a lot of, let's say, basic arithmetic with a lot of numbers. That's where this really shines. Okay, let's switch gears and go from vector API to foreign APIs. They are mostly unconnected. There's like a little bit of a connection in there, but generally speaking, they're unconnected, right? So this is, again, a new topic. And the foreign APIs tackle two specific problems. One of them is that storing data of heap is tough. If you, wanna, if you think garbage collection is sucks and is long, is, is, is takes too long, I can do better, and you want to manage your own memory of heap, then you're supposed to use the byte buffer, but the byte buffer is limited to gigabytes, and it's also like it's not particularly fast, and it's not easy to clean up behind it. So like this is not a not the best API. And so what you can do is you can go one level lower and use unsafe to get you know all the details right and be faster and everything. But that's unsafe. It's not supported. The API can change, and that's not great. So storing data of heap, for example, in large amounts to manage your own memory, or even small amounts just to put them some stuff of heap to then call a native function. Uh, like C code, for example, um, doesn't work particularly great. And Giant Eye itself, Java native interface, the technology to call foreign function, also doesn't work that great. It involves several tedious artifacts, and um, it's not overall well supported. You have like more tool chains involved, so it's not it's not particularly great. And this is where two new APIs come in. Come in. First of all, it's the foreign memory API, which instead instead of giving you a byte buffer and you just, that that does everything, gives you a bunch more classes that allow you to allocate to access and manipulate memory of heap, and also to control when it will be deallocated. Do you need thread-safe access or not? Because thread-safe access is slower, but if you don't need that, you don't want to pay for it either, right? Uh, you can specifically say, I'm done with this now, I want to deallocate the external memory, and that actually works. And the foreign function API builds around a tool called uh, jextract. So it has a bunch of classes like CLinker and function descriptor that you can deal with, and it uses um, method handles to call into native code, but you can generate that with one tool, which is called jextract. So the idea is uh, you take your uh, C file, you run jextract across it, and what you get is a very, very low-level Java API. And then you write your proper API on top of that. But the advantage is your proper API compiles against the Java API, the one that was generated. So when you regenerate it later, because the C library, for example, got an update, you will see that um, you will immediately get compiled errors in your Java code, and you can fix that. So that should make the whole process much simpler. This time, I don't have to guess about the timeline. Uh, foreign function memory API previews in JDK 19, later this year. And the vector API is pretty much done. You can already actually use it. It's pretty stable, too. But when Valhalla rolls around, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then the vector API is going to change. And instead of publishing it now and then later breaking code, or which is much more likely in Java's case, not breaking code and be stuck with an API that isn't ideal, the goal is to uh, stick around and wait until Valhalla is further, um, is further on the route and will actually be merged. Um, there are links to the Vector API. There's a great article by Gunnar Morling called FISPA Simdi style that's highly instructive. And then there's lots of links to the foreign APIs, for example, the state of documents, which are really great. So if you're into you know, off-heap memory or native functions, then that's something that you can uh, take a look at. Okay, that brings us to Project Valhalla. Valhalla has a very weird claim, which is advanced Java VM and language feature candidates, which, I don't know, could be pretty much anything and everything. But it's not just that. Like, it's actually much more specific. What uh, Valhalla aims to do is to fix the split in Java's type system. So Java's type system has primitives and classes. Primitives have all kinds of properties, but we cannot create any of them. We can only create classes. And classes come with two essential properties. They have identity and they are references. So what do I mean by that? All classes that we write come with identity. Identity means um, if you have an int 5 and another int 5, then these int 5s are the same automatically. There's just no other way to do this. But if you write new integer 5 and new integer 5, then these two new integer classes are equal, or sorry, these new integer instances are equal but they're not identical. They are potentially different places in memory, and the JVM keeps them apart. And this identity 
has certain costs. It comes with extra memory for the header. It enables mutability, right? You can only change something that has an identity somewhere in memory. It supports locking and synchronization, but we don't always need all of that. And when we don't need, we still pay for it. They also come as references, right? So Java, when you, when you have an object, you don't actually lug around the, the full object. What you have is a reference to the object, and you, you, know, you pass around the reference. And that gives you memory access indirection, something that Java is somewhat famous for when you try to write high-performance specific numerical code. You don't want to have an array of integers, because then you have an array of pointers, and then you go pointer hunting all over memory, getting constant cache misses. Uh, no, what you want to have is an array of int. So if you have classes, instances of those come with indirection, they can be nulled, which can be useful in some cases, but isn't in many others. And they protect from tearing something I'm not going to go into here. But again, not all types that we want to write need all of that. So Project Valhalla tries to overcome these problems. It does that in basically four, four efforts that build on one another. So the first one is we will likely be able to declare so-called value types. Value types say we don't need identity. We will also be able, most likely, um, to, be, to create primitive types. Primitive types say, I don't need identity and I don't need to be a reference. There was a long discussion about this. Originally, Valhalla only wanted to provide one new kind of type. But the question was then, what about references? Yes or no? We'll see this, uh, this issue come up later. Um, so the idea now is that you can have value types and you can have primitive types and you can choose. Regular classes have both identity and references. Value types don't have identity, and primitive types have neither identity nor references. Then we will hopefully get universal generics. Universal generics means we can, be, we can start using primitives and our own value types and primitive types in generics. But this is just a compiler part. We need specialized generics for these primitives to actually go all the way down to the level of, for example, an array list of int being backed by an int array. And I think like, at least three of the six PhD theses are probably in specialized generics. Okay, so let's have a look at some code. Here I'm creating a class rational number that has a nominator and a denominator, but in front of it I put the keyword value. So this is now a value class. I would still have to write constructors and getters if I want them, and equals and hash code, all of that. I can, add, I can implement interfaces. I can add additional methods. I can basically do all class building stuff that I'm used to, except classes and fields are implicitly final. And there's just a certain, just very few kinds of superclasses that I can have. Uh, so it's very limited what kind of superclass I can have. But I can implement other interfaces and all of that. And this means I give up, give up identity. A value type says, I don't need identity. That means some runtime operations don't make sense. You cannot synchronize on, an, on something that doesn't have an identity because you want to synchronize on that specific identity, on that exact object. Um, and if you use the identity check with the two, um, two, two equal signs, you will get, instead get a comparison by state. Now, the benefits of this is, since this does not have identity, it cannot be mutated, so you get guaranteed immutability which, depending on your programming style, is really great news. But it also makes Java more expressive. You can now clearly say, if you're using domain-driven design, for example, this is a value. And this value you know, has just these properties and nothing more. It's not supposed to change and whatever, you know, all those ideas that come with DDD, for example. But probably, maybe not the most important, but a very important part, at least part of the motivation, was that you will now, the JVM will now have way more ways to optimize this. The JVM will now be free um, to throw away identity and recreate that object. As long as the values stay the same, it doesn't matter. So you will see more optimizations, meaning faster performance. But there are still references. Value types are still references. Well, they can still have null as a default value, and they don't have tearing. Again, as I mentioned, I'm going to skip that. And part of uh, the entire effort is this quote where the JDK, as well as other libraries, has many value-based classes, such as optional and local date time, and we plan to migrate many value-based classes in the JDK to value classes. Now, the term value-based, if you've never heard about that, you should start Googling it right after this talk is over. Uh, so if you look at the JDK, sorry, of the Java doc, for example, for optional or for local date time, you will see at the, one of the last sentences is that this is a value-based class. And value-based is linked to another Java doc document that explains what that means. Essentially, it was created during Java eight times trying to guess what value classes now 
uh, eight years later, might eventually, or probably ten years by the time they're out, ten years later are going to look like and describe certain limitations. Like limitations like don't treat the instance, don't treat identity as being important. Anyway, so these value-based classes will hopefully all end up as value types in the future. But as I already explained, we can go one step further. We can also have primitive types. Now, this looks very much the same as what I did before. This time it's a complex number that has a rational and an irrational part, but I don't call it a value class, I call it a primitive class. And this is almost the same like a value class with one additional exception, one additional thing that I cannot do. I cannot reference my own type. So when you have kind of like a list, like a linked list, uh, you cannot have a primitive class node that as a field has another node. The reason for that is that primitive types are supposed to be embedded, embedded wherever you pass them around. So you don't pass a pointer around. What you pass around is just the values directly. And if you do that, you want to know how large this object is. And if it can reference itself, then you don't know, you know what the memory layout there would be. So as I said before, it's one step further from value classes. So it also doesn't have identity, all the properties just like value types, but also it doesn't have a reference. So that means it cannot have null as a default value. Its default value has all fields set to their defaults. So that means the rational number that I showed you, sorry, that the complex number that I showed you as a default value has rational and irrational part zero, which makes sense. That's a good complex number. It's basically zero. Um, but if you would go back to the value class, that was a rational class, a nominator and a denominator. And a denominator being zero would be weird because that's not actually a number. It would be weird to have as a default value for the rational number class something that isn't a rational number. And so that's why rational number was not a primitive, but a value, so that I can have null as a default value. What I get in exchange for um, not, not having a reference is that the performance can be even further improved to the point where the JVM will be able to, co to optimize this so much that they have the performance of today's primitives. So, for example, if you always wanted to have an unsigned long, you can now create an unsigned long that has a long field. You can create the unsigned long as a primitive class, and the performance will very likely be basically the same as long, which is pretty impressive, to be honest. At least that's what I think about it. Um, now, I could go into boxing a little bit, um, but in the interest of time, let's skip that. Uh, you can always find me around the conference. I always love to talk about this stuff, not only right on stage, but also even later with a cocktail in hand, if you have any questions about any of this, always come ask me. I'll also show you my Twitter later. So I want to skip the boxing of how to turn int into integer and how we'll be able to do that with primitive and value classes. Let's go to universal generics instead. When we all create our own value and primitive classes, it's not bearable anymore that generics wouldn't work with those. That just wouldn't fly, right? So it's already painful enough that generics don't work with primitives, but if we all start creating our own primitives all the time and that wouldn't work together, that would suck. So that's not the case. Um, universal generics promise us to be able to use, for example, long, which is a primitive, of course, or rational number, or our own value type in generics. But as I mentioned earlier, this only works at compile time. At runtime, this would still be an object array. So an array list of, oh, in the case of array list, it would still be an object array. In the case of a function, it would still accept an object as a method instead of an int. So the point is, while yes, now we can write array list of int, it still doesn't give us the performance of an int array, which is something that we probably want. And that's where specialized generics come in. And specialized generics want to fix that. They want to allow us that automatically an array list of int is backed by an int array. So once we've done that, We've healed the rift, well, I say we, <laughs> once Brian and his colleagues have done that, we have healed the rift between um, primitives and classes, and also all the types that we can create that are in between. So we as developers will have much fewer uh, trade-offs to consider between design and performance. We don't have to have man manual specializations anymore. So for example, you know that there's not just stream, there's also in-stream and long-stream and double-stream. And I'm pretty sure the reason why we don't have float stream is because somebody just quit and said, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to trade companies, you can't force me. Uh, <laughs> because this code is very repetitive, it's basically, but it also, like, it's not easy to write. If you ever look at the stream implementations, they are hard. Um, and then having all of these different variants of that. We don't have just function, no, we have to int function. We don't have operator, we have binary, uh, sorry, we have long operator and all of those. Uh, these are all basically, no, basically, these are all manual specializations where we have a stream of, an, of some type 
But if we want to use the primitive version of that, we have to manually specialize the code. If you've ever used Eclipse collections, Eclipse collections use offer primitive collections, right? They have some additional methods, but largely those are just manual, like, okay, let's write an, error, let's write an int list that can just contain ints. And so we don't have to do that anymore. Nobody has to do that anymore. We get better performance. We can express the design more clearly. And if we start passing around immutable objects, I'm also pretty sure that APIs will get more robust. In general, I think that Java gets more expressive and more performant this way. So when are we going to see this? Uh, I think that's like the most, the most, the vaguest of timelines that I'm presenting here. I hope that next year we'll see value classes preview in JDK 20. And then hopefully soon after that, we'll see primitive classes and universal generics. I don't know. And then specialized generics is probably a little bit further down the road. But as I say, I'm gleaning this from public information, and they're not very detailed when it comes to these plans. So maybe Brian is surprising me, and we'll just you know, create uh, all the jabs tomorrow, and they'll be done by JDK 19. I doubt that. Maybe it takes until 2030. But you know, that's my guess. I linked to a bunch of articles here, and I can only recommend uh, the state of Valhalla documents. The part one and two are comparatively easy to read. Like, if you can sit down and if you uh, focus a bit, you can go through those. They're fairly, fairly straightforward, and they give you a lot of information about all what I just talked. And then part three is the JVM model. I didn't understand that. <laughs> that goes into much too low of a detail level. Um, but for those of you who are more technically inclined who like to understand how the JVM works internally, or ideally, who already know that, you can go there and update that information. I also link to a couple of videos here where Brian gave talks about this. OK, enough with all the, with all the object, uh, projects. Let's do something else, at least for a couple of minutes. So I talked about all these large projects that are currently being evolved and are moving into the JDK. But these are not the only things that are happening, of course. There's so much else going on. For example, lots of APIs are added or changed and updated all the time. I don't want to go over all of these here. Just to pick one, let's talk about Unix domain sockets. Um, if you're using, if you have a different services running on the same host, you probably want to you know, communicate between these services. And a usual way to do that is to open up a loopback uh, connection and then do that which is, compared to Unix domain sockets, um, first of all, it's less safe because it opens up a port that theoretically somebody else could connect to, whereas Unix domain sockets work over a file a handle, which uh, is local to the system, and it's also much faster than Unix domain socket. And contrary to its name, that also works in Windows. So if you're one of the few people who have running a Windows server somewhere, that even works there. So if two processes on the same machine, that's important, only works on the same machine, uh, they want to communicate Unix domain sockets give you a safer and faster alternative. And stuff like that is added all the time. We have uh, usability improvements. For example, now we have a simple web server, which is actually running this presentation. The presentation is a website. I'm running it in Chrome. Here you can see that. And it starts with, it, it's running with a Java web server that was added in JDK 18. So now there's a command line tool, jwebstart, no, not jwebstart. JWeb server, <laughs> and uh, off launches a small, very uncomplicated server that just launches a local, local file system. You can do a little bit fancier stuff with that, but it's not for production. It's just for testing and demo purposes. You get better null pointer exceptions now. That's great as well. If you want to observe what's actually going on, JD, JFI event streaming was finished in 14. That's pretty great. So you can connect to a, um, to a JVM running elsewhere and get all the JFR events, which is um, yeah, very helpful when you're looking at, at uh, analytics and observability. Performance gets constantly improved. Specifically, recently, the, the class data sharing archives have been basically, I think it started in Java 9 and 10, and now by, by, by 16, I think they're done now. Oh, sorry, by 13, they're done now with dynamic CDS archives. If you want to reduce your launch times of your app, I can only recommend to look at class data sharing. It will give you 10 to 20% maybe of launch time improvements, depends on how, much, how many classes you load. So that's something to look at. Uh, security is constantly being improved. There are always bug fixes. Sean Mullen, which uh, is in charge of Java security at Oracle, has a great blog. He writes one post exactly every six months, which is when the new Java release comes out and lists all the security enhancements. Uh, so I can only recommend to look at that for a good reason to convince your manager to always stay on the recent version. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. But we're not only adding stuff. Stuff, is also get stuff also gets removed. So uh, for example, uh, if you let's start at the bottom, um, concurrent mark sweep, NASHorn, and RMI are already 
gone, at least on, on the current releases. If you're on Java 11, they're still in there. But if you move to 17, um, they are gone. Did I say RMI? RMI activation, not the rest. The rest of RMI is still there. And there's a bunch of stuff that's deprecated for removal that will go out, will go the way of the Dodo sooner rather than later. Bias lock it, uh, locking Applet API probably soon, whereas I would expect Security Manager and Finalization to stick around a little longer until uh, all code, co code move off of that. If you're wondering, you know, how do I handle all these removals and new APIs, how can I benefit from them the most? Generally speaking, and we're going to come to that in a second, I hope that you all upgrade uh, fairly regularly. But what can you do to make upgrading, to make migrations easier? Well, first of all, stick to supported APIs and standardized behavior. If you feel like, hmm, I don't know how this dependency or how this JDK um, method that I'm calling here behaves, don't just try it out and rely on that behavior. That could technically be an implementation detail, and that happens occasionally, that those implementation details get changed. Look at the API, look at the contract, try to figure out uh, what's been promised to you. If you have the chance, stick to well-maintained projects. You're probably already doing that, but if you're in a situation where you can pick between different um, dependencies, favor those that are well-maintained because they will make it easier for you to upgrade. Generally, try to keep all your dependencies and tools up to date. That's like in generally helpful with security and probably also performance, but it also makes it easier to upgrade when the time comes, right? When, for example, the JDK or Spring or whoever has a critical, um, um, has a critical security problem, but you can't make an upgrade to a safe version because you have to basically make like a new major version upgrade or whatever, then that can hurt you, right? So you want to be on the most recent version if possible. I know this is easier said than done, but it can be done. And upgrading does not get easier if you do it less often. Um, stay ahead of what's being removed. I just said, for example, security manager will be removed at some point. Now is not a good time to write more code that needs a security manager. You can use a command line tool called jdepperscan to run against your code, your bytecode, but also your dependencies bytecode, meaning all the jars that they ship you. And then you get a list of what APIs are being used that are deprecated or deprecated for removal. And then you can see what can we do to reduce the use, what can we uh, do with so dependencies use that less. And the last one, maybe the most important one, try to build on each release, even on early access. So for example, let's say you're on Java 11 right now, I recommend to build on 17 and 19 EA as well. 17 because it's LTS and 19 EA because it's the re most recent one. That doesn't have to happen in every build, right? Not every pull request needs to figure out whether it works with 19 EA. But having a nightly build that does that, and even if it just reports the result, it doesn't even have to break your build, just to let so you know, does this still work? Or are there, are there things coming down the line that, are, that require us to react to? You want to know that as soon as possible. And that's why they're all there. That's why JDeppers can exist. That's why early access builds are out there. So you can benefit from them as early as possible. OK, now let's talk about Java versions. So um, I want to ask you, what's the most modern Java version, the most recent Java version you're using in production. Right? So not just at home for fun, but at your company in production, the most recent ones. So who is on Java 7 or below? Ah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the funny bit is there's always one person, no matter the audience size. I'm wondering, is it? Have you been at JFocus? No? Oh, I was wondering whether you may be following around. <laughs> okay, so who's on Java 8? That's, as was expected, a number of people. I want to say 10% maybe. It's hard to guess. I want to guess 10%. Who's on Java 11? That's more. I want to say 20. Okay, so that drives home my first point. Java is slowly but resolutely overtaking Java 8. So next one, who's on JDK 17? That's also a bunch of people, but I'm not coming, going to end up with 100%, I'm afraid. That's about the same as 11. So that's the second point. Adoption of 17 from 11 also looks really, really good. And now I could just stop asking and assume that the other, what, like 50% are all on JDK 18? But that's probably not the case. So I want to ask, who's on JDK 18 right now? Uh, OK. Well, OK, so we skipped that last point. It's hard to predict the future entirely correctly. But usually I get a couple people. That of course begs the question who the other half that didn't raise their hand or what version they're on, but I'm just gonna uh, chalk it up to shame and assume that you're all on six. Um, okay, 
So let's talk about the last project for the remainder that I have time, which is about seven minutes. Uh, let's talk about Project Loom a bit. So Loom is concerned with JVM features and APIs for supporting easy-to-use, high-throughput, lightweight concurrency, that's all one big issue, and new programming models, that's a separate one, which we're probably not going to get to. So let's start with an, a hypothetical HTTP request to your API. You have a backend somewhere, it does something very simple. In comes the request, you have to parse the JSON, tease out all the information you need, put together a database query, you ask the database, you wait for it to return, you, you know, pull out the data that you want, put it into the response, send it back its way. So how well are you using your runtime resources? You're using it really great for one and three, but for step two, you're just sitting there waiting. Nothing is happening in your runtime. Somewhere off the database is busy, but you're not doing anything. So how would you implement that request? The classic approach is a synchronous one. You have many requests that you have to handle at the same time, and Java offers you a thread to do that, so you could use one thread for each request to do that at the same time. So if you use a thread per request, it becomes really simple to write and debug and profile off this very straightforward. You just block on certain calls. And the problem is that the threads you're using, these, we're going to call them platform threads from here out, but they are directly tied to an operating system thread. Those are somewhat expensive. You can have thousands of them, but you probably can't have millions of them. And somewhere in between, you're going to run out of them. And uh, that's a problem because that can lead, not necessarily does, but it can lead to situations where the limiting factor is how many threads can you have. And that then leads to lower throughput than your system could theoretically support. That's why asynchronous uh, APIs or asynchronous approaches were invented. Now you only use the threads, and this is totally radical, if you actually need them for computation and you don't pay for them when you're lying around. So you use non-blocking APIs with future or reactive streams. The issue with, that, with this is that the code is harder to write, but particularly it's harder to debug and profile. You cannot just easily step through the code. You cannot just easily see where in your process are you. You have to add on top additional tooling. So um, this is not that simple anymore as it used to be. You cannot easily pair this with synchronous code. So if you're relying on this non-blocking uh, behavior and you call a library which doesn't know that you're doing that and just blocks calls, uh, that's not great. But it does share platform threads. That's the big deal. It gives you much better resource utilization and will potentially lead to much higher throughput. But now we end up with a conflict. Do I want to write simple code that can more easily debug and maintain? Or do I want to write more complicated code so that it saves us real money and potentially our users, well, it's not so much about latency, so users probably won't notice that much, but you will be able to run the same, uh, the same app with much fewer hardware resources. And this is where virtual threads come in. Virtual threads, as proposed by Loom and already implemented in 19, um, are just a regular thread. So you can see that thread is written in this weird font. Uh, it, I mean by that it's an instance of the class thread, but it has a very low memory footprint of just a couple bytes or maybe kilobytes. It is very cheap to switch, and very importantly, it's not the operating system that's in charge of switching. The Java runtime schedules that. And that's important because the operating system has to be very careful with what it allows different threads to see when it comes to memory, for example, whereas the JVM doesn't have to do that. The critical part is, while you're waiting, you're not using an OS thread. So what I showed you just so far is what you will use basically above the surface uh, or what you, what you will have to know above the surface. Now let's talk, look a little bit below the surface and let's check out um, how exactly the runtime does that. So the runtime creates a pool of so-called carrier threads. These are actual operating system platform threads. They are going to do the actual work. And then it pairs a virtual thread with a carrier thread doing computation, but when the virtual thread is blocking, what the runtime it does is it takes away the carrier thread and lets it do something else. And then when the call is done, it continues. So let's go through the hypothetical request from earlier. How does that look in a virtual thread? The runtime submits the task that you have to interpret the request uh, to the carrier thread pool. And as soon as a carrier thread is free, it starts with step one. It does that. Then we arrive to step two and it blocks. So the virtual thread thinks, oh, I'm blocking on this database request, which is what you will see while debugging. I'm blocking a database request. But what the runtime is doing, it's, it takes uh, the thread, the carrier thread away, gives it back to the pool, and it will do something else. It will work on something else. And when step two is done, when it unblocks, the runtime resubmits the task, and eventually you're going to get around to continue with, uh, with step three. And that makes 
wading with virtual threads. Super, super cheap. So I have this very impressive, also pointless example, where I create a million of those, and each of them waits, I don't know, a second. Um, virtual threads can wait and sleep with infinite throughput. So this, run this, running this code on a simple laptop like this takes about a second at a very small amount extra uh, that we need to, for overhead. Um, because launching a virtual thread and having it sleep immediately and then do nothing else is basically for free. A little bit more interesting is an approach like this one where you say, um, well, I have to, uh, I'm doing something and I need to do two subtasks. I have task A, oh, let's see, I have task A and task B to do here. And uh, what you can do now is you can say, well, let's give this to a specific executor, but the executor is not like a pooled, it's not a thread pool. No, it creates one new virtual thread for each task. Just give it those tasks get back the futures, wait for them, and then send your results uh, your way. So this way you can split a task in subtasks and not care about pooling or anything. You can just always start using a new virtual thread pool. Now, the important thing is that virtual threads aren't faster threads. So when you, when you, time, when you clock the time from start to beginning of a task that first does a couple milliseconds of computation and waits for the database for a couple 100 milliseconds, say, and then you know, creates, uh, creates the result, that latency from beginning to end, that will not improve. That's not what this is about. So when discussing this, uh, Ron Pressler works on this, presented this overview that I put into a table, uh, which um, juxtaposes parallelism with concurrency. I'm not going to into too much detail, although I do think this is actually worth probably a, um, at least half a talk. But the idea is that parallelism is something where you take a problem, split it up to be done in less wall clock time, to reduce latency. Concurrency is something where the world throws problem at you that you want to handle as fast as possible, or at least as many of them as possible at the same time. So this is about throughput. And Loom is firmly concerned about the right half of that diagram. It's concerned about concurrency. It's concerned about improving throughput. So when your workload is not CPU bound, when the CPU sits idle some of the time, what you generally want to do is you want to start waiting as early as possible. Because when you start waiting on as many tasks as possible, other systems can deal with those, and ideally the results come back sooner, and you get your results sooner. And that's what virtual threads make you do. So you want to uh, look at those when the number of concurrent tasks is high and when the workload is not CPU bound. So you don't want to pool those. You only pull expensive resources. Virtual threads are expensive. You just create a new, th for, each, for each task, just create a new thread. It sounds wasteful, but we have to unlearn what we learned. We learned threads are, are heavyweight, expensive objects that we need to pull. Virtual threads do not have those properties. And it also allows you to create threads, sorry, tasks for subtasks, which gives us a new concurrency programming model. I'm just going to give you the Cliff's Notes, the very short version of that. In the past, well, I didn't. I'm a little bit, well, I could have probably have started earlier. Um, but I already started with structured programming. I already started with at least functions or methods or procedures, I think they were called in Turbo Pascal. But before that, we didn't have that, right? We were just a bunch of code and then go-tos between those. And surely that worked great. And then structured programming came along and taught us, you know what? That gives you maximum flexibility, but it's not actually ideal. For widely maintainable code, what you want to do is you want to have a single entry point and either a single exit point or at least clearly defined exit points for each piece of code. A procedure or method has one point to start and then one or maybe a few points to exit. And that, that understanding of what programming should look like actually influenced languages and runtimes. Right? Later languages do not allow you to just write like one big file and then go to between those lines. No, you have to write methods. You have to even write classes in Java. And structured concurrency tries to apply the same level of thought to concurrency. When the flow of execution splits into multiple concurrent flows, they rejoin the same block of code. So if you want to split, you join later in the same piece of code, instead of splitting and then somewhere else, basically, um, waiting for the results. So uh, we cannot go into detail on this. As I mentioned, you can ask me. I'm around. Feel free to always flag me down and talk about this. Um, Overall, we just look at the first part, virtual threads. They want us to write simple, to write code, uh, code that's simple to debug as well and to profile. 
it gives us higher throughput and this new programming model that we somewhat skipped. Um, virtual threads already preview 19. They were recently announced and merged, so you can already um, experiment with that feature in JDK 19. My personal guess is about structural concurrency is that it might still make it into, into 19, but maybe not, but then it will probably be 20. But that is just like a first shot at concurrency. There will be more structural concurrency APIs in the future, hopefully. There are more links here to everything you can follow up. As I mentioned, I'm Nikolai. I'm also known as NipaFX on Twitter, on GitHub, on YouTube, on Twitch. You can follow me there. Um, I'm working for the Oracle Java team, which wrote stuff like insight.java and dev.java. If you want to know what's going on, these things like this, as it happens, go to insight.java. Uh, it's a great place to, to, to follow closely these developments. Go to dev.java if you want to you know, look for a specific thing, like how do modules work again? How do I explain to a junior what streams work, how streams work? You can see that there. I also wrote a book about the module system, also known as Project Jigsaw. If one of you poor people uh, are tasked to handle that, I'm sorry, but also maybe that book helps you. <laughs> I actually can give you three, way, uh, three copies away. Uh, so yeah, you can come here and I can give you a code for that if you're interested. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>